All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today we're doing a home composting workshop. We're gonna cover hot composting as well as warm composting. I'm Brenda Platt. I'm a master composter and a member of the compost team at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're a national nonprofit organization. We were founded in the District of Columbia in 1974. So next year we'll be celebrating our 50 year anniversary. All right, so here's Megan and myself. Um, these are the sections we're going to cover. What is compost and why? Hot composting basics. I already talked about this, but I'm going to show you the slides, how to get started, setting up. I'm going to cover troubleshooting, how to avoid odors and rodents. Uh, part five is going to cover how do you know when your compost is ready and how to use the compost. And then part six, we're going to just really just do an introduction to composting with worms. Um, all right. Oh, and part seven will be answering your questions. So we'll have some time at the end. All right. So let's dive in since we have so much to cover. Um, so part one, what is compost and why should we do it? What are its benefits? So composting is a living soil amendment. It's not soil. It's a soil enhancer and it's full of stable plant available nutrients and it's rich in what we call organic matter. I like to call it black gold. Composting is a biological process and if we control certain conditions, it's gonna, the materials are gonna decompose quicker. So as this image on the right shows, we're taking food waste mixed with let's say yard trimmings and we do that in the right recipe and we produce that black gold and we are helping to build healthy soils which is this thin layer of skin around the earth which is the source of all our uh, source of a lot of life on earth of course the oceans have a lot of life too um, and it is really all about the soil because at the end of the process you are producing that that soil amendment and there are so many soil benefits this is a poster we created that kind of go, you can download it on our website. We'll share the link. It And it kind of goes through so many of the soil benefits. You have soil, comp, when you add compost to soil, you're improving soil tilth and fertility. You're helping to suppress plant diseases. You're stimulating root growth. You're improving what we call cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of soil to retain nutrients. You're helping soil, uh, retain water. When you add compost to soil, it helps um, the water holding capacity of that soil. Compost helps enhance soil structure. It supports soil biology. And I think we're going to find soon that we're so good at removing our fall leaves and yard trimmings from our home properties that our backyards are starved of organic matter. Why do we think the trees uh, drop their leaves? It's because, and then they drop and they break down to to provide those nutrients back to the tree. So we can be building this healthy soil right in our own neighborhoods, in our own backyards. Another driver for composting, of course, is to reduce your trash. On average, in the United States, about half of what we put out at the curb each week is readily compostable. And of that, 21% is food scraps alone. If you're concerned about the climate, composting is a win-win activity that virtually everyone can do. This is another infographic we produced on the compost climate connections. And I know this infographic is too hard to read, so I kind of took screenshots of parts of it. But first, um, compost helps avoid the methane and greenhouse gas emissions that comes from when we throw our food scraps in landfills. Um, Landfills are one of the biggest sources of methane emissions. It's a, and methane is a highly potent greenhouse gas. It's 84 times more potent in its glo global warming potential than carbon dioxide. In a lot of our communities, our trash ends up at waste incinerators. I have fought my whole professional career <laughs> against the building of trash incinerators and just want to note they're falsely labeled as waste to energy facilities, but they're really wasting resources. They destroy resources and they also produce climate and other pollutants. I talked about the benefits of soil, um, but when it comes to climate, there are many. It, as I mentioned, the water holding capacity, let's just take that example, that really is increasing climate resiliency because it's increasing soil resiliency to extreme heat and flooding. 
And when you add compost to soil, there's humic acids in the soil that kind of act as a glue, helping to aggregate those soil particles and keeping them together. So adding compost to soil helps prevent soil erosion and runoff. So we're helping to protect um, our watersheds. You can also offset um, fossil fuel based fertilizers, which have a huge climate footprint when you're using compost. So there are many climate benefits uh, to using compost um, and enhancing soil is one. The other, I think, which is often overlooked is when added to soil, compost helps it act as a carbon sink, storing carbon in the soil, just like we think of trees as being a carbon sink. So that's a really in, um, important uh, benefit of composting. And then a lot of our work at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is documenting the benefits of composting to build community resiliency. Composting creates many more jobs than landfilling or burning trash. And when you're making that final product and you're using it for rooftop um, gardens or bioswills or rain gardens, you're creating even more jobs in that process. So when you think about where you can send your food scraps, you, we have the option of relying on incineration shown. This is the, stat, the smokestack for the Baltimore incinerator on the top left versus landfills, which are the predominant method in, this, in the United States. Or we could producing, be producing this black gold and putting it back in our soils to grow food, which makes sense to you. I hope you all agree with me. And then I'm just going to wrap up this part um, by just sharing that one of the beauties of composting is that there's no one way to do it. It can be large scale, small scale, and literally everything in between. This facility in the top left handles 30,000 tons per year of food scraps. Um, the one below it on the left is a um, county backyard composting facility. Uh, that um, just handles yard trimmings, not food waste, but it's pretty large scale. Um, we've got the home composting. That's me with one of my home composters in, in the center top, but below that is a farm scale operation. Uh, we've got at least one question for how do we, how do, we do this on a um, farm scale where there's lots of examples for farming on a small scale, but today's um, talk is really focused on home composting. And I'll just share, before I jump to home composting, I just want to say a word about community composting. First, what is it? It's the not so radical idea that compost is used within the same community when the material is generated and the community participates in some way. And there are so many ways to do community composting. There's these in vessel kind of rotating tumblers you're seeing here of different sizes, but there's also open windrow piles. There's more farm scale sizes. And there's many examples, and we have lots of resources on community composting if you go to our website. But today we're focusing on home composting. If you Google home composting bins, you will probably be overwhelmed with all the options. But these are the basic six, six types. And I'll talk more about these in part three when we talk about getting started and setting up your system. But just know like the top middle image shown here is a compost system made from repurposed wooden pallets. You can build your own system. There's many designs available online, but you can also just buy a system and order it from your local hardware store. You can get these stationary systems shown here on the top right or tumblers, both in single chamber and dual chamber. And the prices vary depending on what they're made out of, where they're made, and um, how durable they are. So do read the reviews, and we will talk more about those in part three. We'll also talk later about worm composting, but let me just, and I'll be introducing the basics of worm composting, also called vermicomposting in part six. But for now, just know that vermicomposting is a very different process than hot composting. There's different microorganisms that thrive. Vermicomposting is faster, but it's more limited in the materials you can compost. Worms don't like onions, for, interest, for, in, for instance. They don't like citrus so much, and you don't want your bin to get hot. But it might be a good option if you're in an apartment or you don't have a big yard or you have a small yard so 
you have options. All right, so now welcome to part two, where we're going to cover hot composting basics. And I love to start by introducing the diverse microorganisms that thrive in a compost pile. Actually, they're both micro and macro. So you, micro, you can't see basically with the naked eye. Macro, you can. Composting happens through their efforts. These are your volunteers. Your job is to make them happy. So what you've got is you've got fungi, bacteria, and other microbes that are feeding on your kitchen scraps, your leaves, your yard trimmings. And these are the first level decomposers that thrive in the compost pile. As these microorganisms consume materials, the pile's gonna heat up. So this is important. It's the microorganisms consuming the materials and giving off heat as energy, which is how your pile gets hot. It's not from the sun. It's not from warm weather in the summer. It's from making these microorganisms happy. As your pile cools, it becomes inhabited by common soil microorganisms. These might be protozoa, worms, mites, insects, and then as other, and then, and then other larger organisms feed on those, and they also begin to feed on the organic matter that's produced. And those are the second and the third degree decomposers. And really the whole process is teeming with life. Now, the conditions in your pile can change depending on how active or passive a composter, composter you are, but it's really this diversity of life that helps the process continue. So no matter what system you use or what size you are composting at, you need to know about the key ingredients for good compost, and that's going to be air water, and the food. Just like us, those composting microbes need these things to survive and thrive. Composting is an, aer is an aerobic process. It needs oxygen. It's when it goes anaerobic, starved oxygen conditions that you can tend to get odor. So that's why getting oxygen into your pile is going to be critical. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We live on a carbon-based planet, so everything has some amount of carbon in it. But green materials here in the context of composting refer to materials that are relatively high in nitrogen, whereas browns refer to materials that are relatively low in nitrogen. You might have heard about heard these terms. Basically, you can think of browns as materials that don't rot so easily. Think of plant stalks, woody plant stalks, or wood chips, or your fall leaves, right? Whereas your greens are more putrescible. They're going to rot more easily. Um, they have more moisture to release. In general, all organisms, including us humans, we need 25 to 30 times more elements of carbon than elements of nitrogen. Now that's on a dry chemical basis. That's kind of the element of carbon, right? And um, versus nitrogen, we need 25 to 30 times more. And our microbes need that too. So we need to supply them with the carbon and nitrogen in the right proportions in order for them to thrive. So if you have too much nitrogen in your compost pile, that excess nitrogen is converted to ammonia and you can have odor problems. So you never ever want more food scraps than your browns. You don't want more food scraps than your uh, leaves, your wood chips. In practice, to to achieve this carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30, again, that's on a dry chemical basis, the general guideline is, is to add two to three times more browns by volume than your greens. So if you've got a big compost system that you might be thinking in wheelbarrows, or if you're at a community compost site, but it could be you know, a five gallon bucket, it could be your kitchen pail, but just kind of keep, keep that in mind. And you're gonna always need to have browns on hand and ready to use. You can't just compost your food scraps. You need to have those browns. And one of the reasons we're offering this um, workshop right now is fall has begun for many of us. And fall is a great time to start composting and to keep those, gather those leaves, don't put them out at the curb, and you're going to need them all year round. Okay, let's get into acceptable materials. What can you compost and what should you avoid? 
Okay, so the first thing um, is your just to go through the greens is we have your fruit and vegetable scraps. You want to leave off those those fruit stickers if you can. They do not break down. You can put eggshells into your pile. I just recommend uh, just crushing them, grabbing them, and crushing them because they won't break down otherwise. Uh, it takes a very long time. Coffee grounds, paper filters are fine. I tend to buy unbleached ones. I think they're preferable. You can put tea bags in your pile. Um, just rip out the staples if they have them or buy tea bags without staples and avoid the plastic tea bags. If you don't know whether it's plastic at the end of the process, you will know. They will not break down. You'll pick them out. And if you're going to add garden trimmings, like more of the, not the woody stalks, but the kind of green leaves, just, just chop it into six inches or smaller um, if you have some garden shears. The browns, fall leaves, plant stalks, wood chips and shavings. You can add some newspaper and brown bags. Don't ask, don't add glossy pages or magazines. And I do recommend you just kind of rip them. So it says here shredded newspaper and brown bags. As I mentioned, oxygen is important. So you don't want to put sheets of plastic, uh, sheets of paper. You don't want plastic either, but you don't want sheets of paper that's going to prevent the airflow th through your pile. Now, meat, dairy, oil, grease, cooked food, those increase the risk of attracting rodents. And also, one thing to note is rodents really cannot thrive off of fruit and vegetable scraps alone. They need a balanced diet that includes protein. So deny them that food and uh, deny them meat, dairy, and cooked human food. Also, these types of Materials tend to have a little bit more odor associated with them. They are compostable. Just want to emphasize, like, I do know people who compost them, but they know what they're doing. They're, they're tracking temperatures. If, you if you're lucky enough to be in an area that has curbside collection of food scraps, you may be able to put this in your bucket. It may be going to a commercial facility that's, or a municipal facility that's really tracking temperatures and doesn't have not an urban area with what I call rodent pressure, meaning there are rodents in your alleys, you know they're in your communities. If you have any doubt, leave anything out of your bin. You wanna to try to pick off those produce stickers. Like I said, they don't, they don't break down. Um, pet waste, glossy paper, treated or painted wood leave, leave out. Pet waste have a high likelihood of containing pathogens, such as toxoplasmosis, which is um, prevalent in cat feces and can be extremely infectious. So as such, don't compost pet waste, especially if you, if you are new to composting or plan to use your compost to grow edible plants. Um, as a general rule, also avoid diseased or poisonous plants and aggressive weeds. If you keep weeding it from your garden, don't put it in your compost. Also, certain herbicides um, uh, will persist through the composting process. So compost made with plants treated with herbicides may damage the plants you want to grow. So just uh, keep that in mind. And I actually think one of the benefits of home composting is that you can control what you're putting in your bin, which is a little harder at a community compost site. It's a little harder for municipal and commercial composters to exactly control. But we can. We can control what we put in there. Uh, and avoid dryer lint. Um, Dryer lint, you know, let me just say, since most of our clothes are no longer made of natural materials or just cotton, you are likely going to introduce plastic or synthetic materials into the compost if you're adding dryer lint. Dryer lint is a source of uh, microplastics, and one source of that is our fleecy sweaters that, um, you know, it's great that they're made from recycled bottles, but they can uh, release microplastics from the washing process into the water and and so don't add lint use tissues we've added to the list simply because no one wants to be handling someone else's used tissues especially if that person may be sick but for a home composter that's really a personal preference one thing i want to emphasize is you really want the clean good stuff again teach your housema housemates your family members when in doubt to leave it out and I'll say a word about compostable products. Um, compostable, even if products are labeled as compostable, um, 
they may not break down unless they're certified. The idea is that they're designed to break down in composting systems, but just because they're labeled as compostable doesn't mean that they will break down in your system, particularly if you're not reaching high temperatures. So just be, be careful of those and do look, if you're gonna be, you, you know, you have takeout, one of these takeout containers, if it's labeled as even commercially compost, compostable, it could break down in your home composting system. Um, but if it's not labeled, it could be coated with um, plastic. So this one was certified. This one looks like it might be compostable, but it's it's um, the one on the right. But it is um, it's uh, coated with plastic. So, and the other benefit of of BPI certified products is um, that third party certification is helping to avoid certain chemicals and heavy metals. Uh, the new certification um, has some criteria for avoiding PFAS, which are known to be toxic and bioaccumulative. So just be careful of uh, putting in products labeled as compostable that aren't certified. And again, you'll hear this me say this, when in doubt, leave it out. Okay, so we've talked through the food for your microbes. Now let's talk about water and moisture. So composting microbes live in a water layer around each of the material particles in our pile. And so they rely on that water to eat, move around, live. So they need a lot of water. And the ideal range is really, you know, 45 to 60%, 50% is even better. So another way to think about this is half the weight of your composting mix should be come from water. And it could be present in the foodstocks, in your feedstocks, and your materials going into the pile. That's what feedstock is. So if you're putting in your wet food scraps from your kitchen, that's a source of moisture. One thing to know is that often we build our piles and then we water afterwards. You want to water as you're building your pile if it needs moisture. Because again, you want that layer of moisture around each particle for those microbes. If you just water after you built your pile, the water is just going to run off your pile. It's not going to be in your pile, okay? The other thing to think about is as your pile heats up, some of that moisture is going to evaporate. So you want to keep a close eye on the moisture content, and you want to make sure it's evenly distributed as much as possible through your pile. So if you've been composting and nothing's been happening in your pile, this could be one of your reasons. So regular turning and mixing can help with this. Um, and you know if your pile is um, if the pile is too dry, your microbial activity is going to slow or cease. And if it's too wet, then you're going to lose those air pockets in the pile, the air spaces which are key to the airflow. And then it's going to lead to those anaerobic conditions, meaning there won't be oxygen in your pile. So you don't want it too wet. It's got to be just right. Um, so how do you know when your moisture is? 50 to 60 percent. Well, we teach this hand squeeze test. So when you're first building your pile and you want to see if the moisture is right or if you're testing it halfway through to see if it's, you need to add more moisture, grab a handful of your pile and squeeze it. OK, and what you want is a few drops dripping between your knuckles. Some people say it feels like a wrung out uh, sponge. Some people don't understand what that means. That's okay. You want a few drops dripping, but you if it if you were to hold your hand up and it drips down your arm into your armpit, it is too wet. You don't need to do that, but sometimes we call this the armpit squeeze test. Um, but if you open your hand and it's very dry um, and you don't get any drops, then it's too dry and you consider adding water. Um, if it you also squeeze it and the materials kind of more or less stick together is also kind of what you want, or at least some of it, not all of it needs to stick together, okay? So that's one trick. One thing I think is one of the most important things I wanna leave you with today is that the secret of composting is oxygen, is air. And if you have one of these stationary piles or one in a, in a bin system, not a tumbler, um, you know, actually tumbling can do this too, but what turning does is it charges the material with fresh air. It distributes that moisture. 
the nutrients, the organisms. It breaks up clumps of materials. It in invigorates and provides that burst of microbial activity. So pay attention to oxygen. It's a little harder in those tumblers because they, they do have holes, but sometimes the holes can be cleared. So when you're opening the hatch, you know, try to fluff it up inside and get oxygen in there because those tend to more easily get anaerobic than other systems. The other thing I'll just mention is do pay attention to density. When we have a very long, uh, you know, longer uh, training session, we can teach you more about the density you're aiming for and how to measure density, which we don't have time today. But you don't want your pile to become too compressed or dense because then it'll lose its airspace. So pitchfork can be your best friend. Um, Sometimes we put those fall leaves in and they are wet and matted like this, and they that may block the airflow. The same can go with like cardboard and paper that I mentioned earlier. You don't want just a sheet of that. So break up those clumps of leaves, rip the paper into strips, cut up the plant stalks like those shown on the left. You know, it doesn't have to be cut up into fine pieces, just like six, six inch, eight inches pieces. And that's going to just help the air flowing through the pile. So I want to really leave you with this thought that you can home compost at what le whatever level of effort you would like to, whatever suits you. You don't need to track temperatures if you don't want to. If you don't do hot composting, you won't be optimizing conditions for your microbes. Know that it will be slower. Your system will fill up faster because it's not breaking down as quickly. Um, if you do pay attention to oxygen and moisture and kind of balancing your browns and greens it's and you're turning your pile, then it's going to be faster and it's going to be quicker. The other benefit is that um, reaching high temperatures is going to prevent those weed seeds from germinating. So you're going to kill the weed seeds and you're going to reduce any risk of pathogens. Okay. But passive or cold is fine too. If you're a dump and run person, just make sure you're always covering your food scraps. Now this chart shows on the bottom kind of days of decomposition decomposition, 40 days and beyond, and then the temperature, we're in Fahrenheit here, so 80 to 160 degrees. And it kind of just shows how turning can speed up the process. By turning the pile, you're charging that material with fresh air, um, uh, as I mentioned, and so there's many benefits. And you can see if you're turning during the first few weeks, every three days, you will get to above 140 degrees. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about tracking temperatures. There are these temperature probes you can buy. In the U.S., they run about $40 to $50. Um, and they will show you in the 80 to like um, 130 degrees is steady, active, kind of more slow composting. Above 130 um, to 160 is kind of really hot. You really want to be the sweet spot if you want to get hot is really that 110 to 155 degrees. That's that's the desired range where you're destroying the risk of pathogens, fly larvae, the weed seeds. You need 145 degrees to kill most weed seeds or prevent them from germinating. T tomatoes take higher. It's more like 153 degrees, which is why we often have um, uh, tomato plants growing in our compost pile, but 131, which is almost where this thermometer is right now, is what you need to kill human pathogens. So, and you need to be at that temperature for three consecutive days, okay? And the composting process is what produces the heat. And again, the heat drives off the moisture. So you want to manage, manage that. Okay, I just want to share that for those of you who are interested in using a temperature uh, get, you know, to track the process. The temperature is really a great way to see what's going on. But I will tell you, uh, another option is your nose. As we say, the nose knows. So if you're smelling a, a bad odor, you know, something that really is noxious, that is a sign that something is wrong and you need maybe more browns, you need more oxygen, uh, maybe less water. So the nose knows, and that can will be your guide. Now, composting does have a smell, but it shouldn't be something that's um, 
you know, really a nuisance or, or noxious. So keep keep that in mind. All right, part three. Welcome to part three, where we'll cover for composting, getting started, setting up your system, uh, what tools you might need, some basics on building a pile. So again, let's talk about home composting systems. Um, you need sufficient volume in order to do home composting effectively. The smaller systems are harder to get hot. Do read the reviews of all these systems if you're gonna buy one. There are differences in assembly, for instance. There are differences in recycled materials used. There are distance, some, if you care about supporting local or US made, some are made in the United States, some are made outside the country. But these um, tumblers or in-vessel systems, you know, or making your own that's completely enclosed, you know, are great if you're in an urban area with rodent pressure, you know there are rodents, or if you don't have a lot of space. Um, some of these are easy for kids to turn. Some are on the vertical axis, and those are harder to turn, by the way. So you want these turning. If you're going to get a tumbler and um, you have uh, physical issues, you do get one that's on the horizontal axis. And I recommend getting a bin with latches um, if you're getting a tumbler because some there's some bins that the plastic latch kind of slides off. So again, if you're in an area where you know there are rodents or uh, you're in a dense urban setting, do get ones with latches that you can secure. Some of these tumblers come with dual chambers. They're designed to let one compartment finish while you start another com compartment. But when you get to dual chamber tumblers, the compartments become smaller. So it, again, it becomes harder to heat up. And so um, you might consider, if you can afford it, getting a bigger tumbler, which has more space. These stationary systems kind of many sizes. They basically start at 80 gallons and go on up. And so, um, and then, you know, making your own multi-bin system. These are great because you can be adding to bin one. And then as that's filling up, you can start bin two or you can flip bin one to bin two. And then you can store finished compost or browns in a third bin. There are many do-it-yourself designs on the internet check those out. So you may be saying, well, how do I choose? Well, it really depends. How big is your yard, your garden, your farm? Um, if your yard is very big and you have a lot of trees, you may want a bigger system, like a three bin system and make it. Um, how much you know, trimmings do you have? How much material do you have? You may have an idea of that. How big is your household? Um, or if you're at your community site, your community site. As I mentioned, do you have rats in your neighborhood? You do not want to use an open system like this if you have rats, okay? You want an enclosed system. You can make it yourself. Um, do you want to kill all the weed seeds and make sure you're reaching at least that 140 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, if that's the case, you need to make sure you have enough volume to get hot, which is basically at least three feet by three feet by three feet. So you need an 80-gallon system or... Um, three feet by three feet by three feet in volume. Uh, one thing I encourage you to do is contact your local community, your jurisdiction, your city, your county. Many cities and counties have backyard programs. They have been giveaways or they offer them at reduced price. Um, and some of them require you take a training in order to receive a bin. We did a report some years ago Yes, in my backyard, a home composting guide for local government. So if your government doesn't have a program, you can encourage them to start one. This might be a good guide to share with them. Um, all right, let's get into what supplies you might need. I mentioned you don't need a temperature probe, but it can be useful. But think, how are you going to collect your uh, kitchen scraps in your in your kitchen? You need some kind of pail. Um, you know, how are you moving materials, your carbon, your finished compost? You can do it with just buckets, but maybe you need a wheelbarrow. If you're using a stationary system um, or a, a multi-bin system, you're going to want a compost or manure fork, you screener or hardware cloth. Um, hardware cloth is metal mesh, quarter inch is what I recommend. You can buy a screener or build your own. You need to maybe shears to cut those yard trimmings. Gloves are a good idea. Um, face mask, I'll talk about 
um, in a few minutes, but that could be useful during dry conditions. You don't want to be breathing in those uh, bio aerosols or um, airborne particles and you need water. So, you know, um, do you have a garden hose with a spray nozzle? How are you going to get water? So you need access to water. So I'm going to cover now some basic steps to getting started. Um, and I'm going to go through, there's 11 steps I'm going to cover. I'm going to go through these one at a time. The first one is where are you going to locate your bin? So having a site with good drainage, uh, convenient to your kitchen, convenient to your water so source. You need room to move around. Often people put their bin right up against the fence, but having room around it is a good idea. Second, you want to set up your browns. You're going to need that carbon source throughout the year to mix with your food scraps. So that can be an open bin, um, you know, a chicken wire or a geo bin, something like that. Um, you can have another, you know, garbage can. You can just have the bags available, but some way to have access to those browns. Have your tools accessible, your pitchfork, your temperature probe if you're using one. Uh, you're, you're going to decide on your kit, kitchen pail, what you're going to use. Then we're, you're going to build your pile. I'm going to cover that in a little bit. I did include those slides. You're going to build your pile. You're going to aerate and mix. You're going to check and adjust the moisture as it gets hot. After eight weeks minimum, more likely 12 weeks, you can your compost may be ready. And we're going to cover in a different part how you know when your compost is ready and how to use it. Screening is op optional, but if you have a lot of corn cobs or avocado pits, um, those won't break down. You know, screening is great to just get those out and put those back in your pile, and then you're ready to start a new pile. You can uh, empty and move it if it's a movable system. You don't need to, and you can start again. Okay, so preparing your materials, let me just say size matters. You want to chop as needed, aim for two to six inches. Just imagine if you're putting a whole corn cob in your pile, there's less surface area for those microbes to work. But if you're just breaking it in half or breaking in third or chopping it while you have it on your butcher block, then you're creating more surface area for those microbes to do their job. So that can be important. Try to train your household to remove those proto stickers. But you know, you can screen or pick them out at the end, um, but this is at the end of the process. They will be there. Okay, so let's say you have your bucket of kitchen scraps. It's full. This is what it may look like. This is my household over a few days. Uh, garlic, cilantro, banana peels, avocado, um, more banana peels, pistachio nuts. I put them in. They break down. There's a tea bag, um, citrus, coffee grounds. We generate a quarter pound of coffee grounds every day. Um, you come out, this is one of the systems I've had set up. I've had, I have a different system now, but you will need lots of grounds. So collect your leaves and keep them. And this is the storage, uh, one setup. This is a, a, a geo bin with the leaves and I have space around both my systems to move around and it's right there. And okay, so building a pile. Method one is the lasagna method where you basically, um, you want to add twigs or wood chips at the beginning. Think about the airflow through the pile. It's like the chimney effect. Or if you're building a campfire, you want to draw cool air in the bottom and, cool, and warm air rises. So what you put at the bottom really does help to promote airflow. So fill your yard trimmings um, at the right uh, uh, moisture level. And you just want to make sure or put a layer of of yard trimmings and you want to make sure that you um, uh, then you add like lasagna may you add this layer of greens and you want to make sure there's no exposed rotting food on the sides to the best of your ability because exposed food can attract flies which is kind of a nuisance it's not really a problem in the composting process so you always want to add a flat layer of browns um, to cover your food scraps at least two inches thick and then you're going to repeat um, and the pile will really start cooking as you fill your bin and you, and assuming you have a good balance of browns and greens and moisture and oxygen. So that's the lasagna method. Sometimes lasagna method, until you flip your pile or you mix it, it really won't stop cooking. So another 
method is kind of what you might call is in the nest, where you still put your twigs at the bottom, you fill your bin with yard trimmings at the right moisture, um, you make a small hole or nest in the center, you add your food scraps, um, and then you cover the browns, you'd want no food scraps visible. And then um, the next time you come before making the nest again, you kind of get your pitchfork in and you mix it. And you could put, you don't have to do it in the middle, you could do your nest on the side here, on the side here, but you know, kind of rotate it, but mix it as you go after, you know, the next time you come, give it a, a little mix. You don't have to flip it all the way to the bottom, but just kind of getting those food scraps mixed in. Otherwise you're gonna have this, this center that's kind of got too many greens and could contribute to odors. All right, so tumblers, um, you're gonna add your browns at the right moisture level. You're gonna add your greens, make sure that your browns are at least twice as twice the volume of the greens. You're gonna close it, you're gonna tumble. And then what you might do is open it and cover with the layer of browns just to, expo to cover and expose food and then don't latch it, don't tumble it again. So that's a tip. I just wanna say a word about um, health and safety that, um, you know, use gloves appropriately, careful with hand to mouth contact, wash your hands, treat your, your cuts and scrapes immediately, protect your wounds. Um, airborne particles, you can inhale them, which is why I recommend wearing a mask. There are fungal spores. There's Aspergillus fumigatus, which not only is in compost and rotting fall leaves, but also in soil. So even if you're a gardener, gardener and you're dealing with your soil and it's dry and you're noticing the soil is becoming airborne, you might want to wear a mask. And now with COVID, we all have masks. And definitely wear a mask if you have asthma, cystic fibrosis, or other respiratory issues. Um, all right, now I'm going to get into troubleshooting and some basic tips. So welcome to part four, troubleshooting composting, basic tips, how to avoid odors, how to avoid rodents. So you know, basically, if your compost has a bad odor, could be there's too much nitrogen in the pile, could be there's not enough air. So add more carbon, uh, turn your pile. If the center is too dry, not enough water, moisten your pile, turn it. If it's damp and warm only in the middle, it could be that your pile is too small. So maybe collect more pile, build up your pile. If it's damp and it's still not heating up, it could be there's a lack of nitrogen. Uh, in the winter, this is a good to just kind of add uh, coffee grounds or something that's a good source of nitrogen that's smaller pieces that kind of give it more the kick and makes it more available. So you can, grass clippings is also a good source of, of nitrogen too. Um, avoiding odor issues, you know, again, you want a site with good drainage. You don't want it sitting in a pile of water. Um, practice good housekeeping. Uh, don't add the meat, don't add the cooked food, don't add the dairy or fish. And you want prompt handling of your food scraps. So, you know, I showed a, I think that's a, is that a three gallon bucket I showed earlier? But, you know, if you get a five gallon bucket, you're not going to empty it till it's full. And that food scraps is going to begin to release its liquid in that bucket before you take it out to your compost system. And it's going to start to get smelly. So, one of the benefits of home composting is you are handling those food scraps before they have a chance to be uh, get smelly and be a good neighbor. Like don't be generating those those um, odors or have your site look unsightly. Have those browns on hand at all time. I've been emphasizing this. All right. Have to talk about rodents. Rodents carry many diseases, including hantavirus and leptospirosis. Uh, leptospirosis is a re very rare bacterial infection, but it is spread through their urine. So if you're around soil or water where an infected animal is peed, that germ can invade your body through breaks, break, you know, mostly through breaks in your skin, like scratches or open wounds. Um, it can also enter your, your nose and mouth. So avoiding rodents is critical. Let me just say that the rodents are here in our communities and often composting gets blamed, but it's our open public trash cans, it's open dumpsters. If you're near an open dumpster, it's overflowing trash cans. That is what giving is giving rodents a 24 seven buffet of food. And when we start to control the rodents and con I mean, excuse me, when we control our food scraps, we're controlling the rodents. One healthy female Norway rat, which is the kind that thrives 
in the mid-Atlantic and huge parts of the United States can have 84 offspring in one year. So you have to beat them back if you know there are rodents in your neighborhood. And you want to site your compost system away from trash cans and dumpsters. So we have this sheet of nine tips to avoid rodents. Let me quickly go through them. I've mentioned this multiple times. Do not compost meat, dairy, fats, oil, cooked food. Never leave your food scraps exposed. Always uh, incorporate all bits of food well in into the pile. Make sure they're not visible. Um, you want to cover the piles with the thick layer of your browns. And you want to maintain at least three feet of space around your system. Uh, open space makes rodents nervous about predators. Think like a rodent with a hawk. They like, um, they like clutter. They like hiding places. They like to run around protected areas like walls. So avoid clutter. Trim back your grasses and shrubs to eliminate potential rodent hiding places. And then if you're an active composter, that's a plus because... Um, if you're turning your piles frequently, rodents see no opportunity for habitat to make a home in your pile. If you have a bin system, like what's shown here, I do recommend a barrier at the base to prevent um, any critters from, you know, rodents. It could be, you know, mice, not just rats. Um, sometimes in the winter, they might tend to be attracted to your bin. So a quarter inch hardware cloth or something else inhospitable, if you're putting it on cement or a six inch dugout pit with sand or gravel can work. And then, you know, if you're able to moving your system from time to time, again, rodents like habitats that are undisturbed. So activity is good. All right, and this just shows an example of um, hardware cloth staked under, um, you can just get tent stakes, uh, REI, other places uh, to stake it out on top of that will prevent um, critters from coming in. Not the critters we want, not the microorganisms, but just the ones, the pest we don't want. Okay, so um, welcome to part five, how to know when your compost is ready and using it. So this kind of shows um, a picture of compost that's ready to use. This bin wasn't heating up anymore because basically it was full of finished compost that was ready to be harvested. Um, so there are several indicators to tell when your compost is finished. It's gonna have this kind of dark brown color. It's gonna be crumbly and loose. Um, it has an earthy smell. It should have an earthy smell. You shouldn't be able to recognize the material you started with. Like you shouldn't be able to recognize a leaf or straw, you know, your food scraps. Sure, if you have corn cob or uh, avocado pit or a pineapple top that'll take some time or um, you can put that back in but um, and there'll be some twigs and sticks may persist and you can sift those out but really the pile is going to have shrunk to about one third of its original volume um, so screening is optional you can buy a screener but you can make your own with this kind of uh, metal mesh I just wanted to show you one that's really simple. That's me screening over a five gallon bucket. Uh, once I cut the mesh, it has sharp edges. So use duct tape. Um, and then I just screen right into a bucket as I need it. And then I use the, the compost. And you can see when I'm screening, I I'm I like to cover my, my face. So I'm not breathing in those particles, if especially if it's really dry, as I mentioned um, in a previous part. So screening, um, depending on what you put in, like you see mango pits, it, oops, sorry. You see a mango pit, avocado pit, lots of seeds, egg, these are eggshells. You can put those right back into your pile and they're kind of inoculated with your microorganisms. Um, this is a screener that someone built for me that fits over a wheelbarrow. It's really great. Um, and uh, let's move into how to use compost. I don't really have a lot of time to talk about this, but basically no, you can incorporate your compost if it's finished and it does need time to cure and mature um, eight weeks. So eight to, four, eight to 12 weeks, as I mentioned at minimum, but once it's mature, you can mix a two to four inch layer of compost into the top six to eight inches of your soil prior to seedling or transplanting. You can use it as a mulch. You can use it as a potting mix for seedlings and small containers. Um, we can um, probably copy this and share this with you in the notes. 
uh, the potting mix if you're interested or reach out to us. All right, so I am running out of time. So I am going to really scream through worm composting. So welcome to part six, worm composting, also known as vermicomposting. One key thing to know about vermicomposting is it is all about the surface area. So the process relies on a type of earthworm that rises to the surface to consume the materials. So depth is not a factor like in hot composting. In fact, you don't want big deep systems because they can get hot. So um, this process relies on not only earthworms, but also a wide range of microorganisms that eat the materials and convert them into this valuable soil amendment we call vermicompost. And vermicompost is a higher value than regular compost, which is amazing. So the physical characteristics of vermicompost is that it's fine, got a fine particulate structure, it's granulated, um, it has a higher water holding capacity, it has higher nutrient holding capacity, it results in accelerated germination of your plants, seedling growth, early flowering, uh, the pH is near neutral, so you've got a lot of plant available nutrients. It's full of plant growth hormones. So vermicomposting is amazing. You don't have to worry as much about oxygen as you do with hot composting. The worms come up for air. The bedding that you put them in should be fluffy. So let me just go through some kind of key differences. So uh, vermicomposting utilizes worms and bacteria mostly. Hot composting use, utilizes, um, in addition to bacteria, also utilizes the heat-loving organisms like fungi and other microorganisms. The temperature range for worms is usually between 55 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about it is what we would like. We don't like to be you know, freezing. We don't like to be above 85 degrees. Um, so your worms are the same way. The moisture content in your worm bins is actually higher at 70, 90%. The process is quicker. You can have finished compost within 30 days. Whereas for hot composting, you know, it's minimum two months, six months is even better to let it, uh, hot composting, to let it cure and finish. Vermicomposting is passive aeration. The worms do not like vibration and turning, whereas with hot composting, aeration and turning is highly recommended. And again, the surface area is important, not volume, and in hot composting, volume is important. So one good source of vermicomposting is um, North Carolina State Extension, and uh, we'll be sharing the link with you. Rhonda Sherman is amazing. She's been my mentor for more than a decade. And so how to troubleshoot, how to build a bin, you'll find many resources on this website. There's a lot of misinformation on the web. So I am sending you to a reputable site for more information. But basically some earthworm facts. Um, let's understand our little workhorses. They're an animal, not an insect. They can't shiver, so whatever the ambient temperature is, that's what they are. If you're cold, they're cold. They do not produce their own natural heat. So you really have to facilitate a com comfortable temperature for them. The air exchange goes through their skin. They don't have lungs, they don't breathe. And, um, and that's why they need moisture. So the only way for them to, to do that air exchange is if their skin is moist. They're hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both genders. They have sperm and egg, but they don't self-reproduce. It does take two to tango. Um, they have this band that you may be familiar with, and in mature worms, the band is closer to the front. They do not have eyes, but they have light receptors. So you need to protect them from the light. So you don't want a bin that's clear. You want a bin that doesn't have the light coming in. Um, if you've ever, after a rain, seen the worms like on the sidewalk and you're like, why don't they crawl back to the grass over there? It's because they get paralyzed by light after about 40 to, to um, 60 minutes an hour. So that's why, you know, you'll join me. This is me holding a bunch of worms after a rainstorm, picking them up and throwing them back into, um, into the earth. So they have teeny tiny mouths. They're like, they hoover microorganisms and they poop them out. So they're like little 
factor microorganisms beneficial microorganisms factories so they're they're just their guts are teeming with microorganisms they're amazing and that's why they can do so much to help soil and plants and that's why vermicomposting is so valuable so i just want to share that there are categories of worms like there's marine worms uh, those that kind of invade our bodies but we're talking about earthworms and most people think earthworms are alike they are not and it's really important to get the right kind you cannot just go out to your garden and dig out earthworms so scientists have divided them into these three different categories depending on what they like to eat and where they live so the epigeic is what we're interested in they're the litter feeders the litter litter not being litter like trash but like leaf litter that drops you know drops and falls they're living under that leaf litter um, and they do not burrow so if you go out to your garden and get earthworms like the endogeic worms that live in soil and burrow, um, if you get the wrong worms, they are not going to rise up and eat your food scraps. And then there's the type that are anaseic that live in soil and they have extensive vertical um, burrows. So get the right ones. Epigeic worms that we want do not live in soil. So Isenia fetida is the number one species of worms used around the world for vermicomposting. They respond to a wider variety of environmental conditions. They breed, they move in captivity. Um, one way to make sure that you're getting the right type is to use the scientific name. They're um, commonly referred to as red wigglers, but by Isenia fetida and watch out for um, shady internet sellers. Counting worms is not fun, so always start with at least one pound. And because it's a surface area, you're gonna add one pound to one square foot of surface area of bin. Um, they're the top feeders. So we want more, vo um, with more volume, the bin could get hot. So the, if you are in a tropical area, there are species of worms that will thrive in a tropical area, night, African night crawler, the blue worm, the Alabama or Georgia jumper. So you have some other, other options. They will eat 25 to 30% of their body weight daily. So um, keep that in mind. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But do get worms from a reputable source. These are three that I know of. Um, and we will share the links with you. So when you order your worms, they're going to come in a box like this. They'll be in some bedding that they probably don't like to eat. So they're a little bit you know, asleep, if you will when they're being shipped, but you're going to gently drop them into the top of the bin. They're, leave your bin open. They're going to move away from the light, so you don't need to touch or help them. Helping will only tear their skin, so um, they're, they're great motivators. So what kind of bin should you get? Well, you have options, just like with hot composting. You can buy a bin off the market. There's many available, or you can make your own, but basically they all have the same principle where you've got these trays and the worms you're putting the bedding in one tray and feeding them in one tray and then as that tray is converted to the vermicompost you stop you make new bedding in the tray above it and start putting a food scraps there and the worms will just migrate up to where the food is and then you'll be able to harvest this bottom tray um, some of them have spigots to drain off the liquid. The liquid comes from the food scraps giving up, breaking down and giving up their liquid, and some do not. Uh, some have solid legs, some have more wobbly legs, so that could be a factor in your decision. And of course, you can build your own. I've seen benches, seen somebody repurpose a bathtub. Worms need bedding. This is a good time with the fall leaves. You could use fall leaves, you could use newspaper. Uh, shred it, tear it. You do need to soak the bedding and drain it before adding to the worm bin. Um, the worms are more picky than the microorganisms in the hot pile. So fruit and vegetable scraps, great. Eggshells are actually okay. Um, they're good for the worms have gizzards and so it helps they need some grit in there coffee grounds paper filters are okay tea bags no staples and you really want to avoid e even more materials than in hot composting you want to avoid the meat grease bones dairy products definitely cat dog feces they don't like hot peppers anything in the onion family 
in the garlic family, uh, no citrus fruits or rinds, avoid very salty or sugary foods, avoid fruit pits, fresh grass. Um, the reason you um, don't want sugary foods that can attract ants, uh, pet feces can have pathogens. Um, what about flowers, you may say? Well, it just takes up space. And these are our princesses. So, you know, if you have a lot of yard trimmings and things like flowers, a backyard bin that gets hot is bigger and more forgiving. Um, so the reason we avoid tomatoes too is it tends to be too acidic. You know, citrus can fall in this category too. And if the pH is too acidic, you could attract red mites, which are not good. They're very parasitic to elderly and sick worms. Peat moss too is acidic, so avoid that. You can store your fruit scraps, by the way. You can put them in the freezer. So the worms will just avoid the frozen stuff and go feeding when it's, um, when it's ready. So I know I'm over time. For those of you who need to go, uh, feel free. This will be recorded. You will be shared the link and I will stay and just know I will answer your questions um, um, till we get through most of them for at least 15 minutes. So my apologies if, for those of you who need to go. All right. So chop your food scraps. Worms do not have teeth. Particle size is more important for worms than in hot composting. And homogeneity is also more important. They're a little picky eaters. So you can't just throw a bunch of, of tough broccoli stalks. They won't like it. In fact, it's a, if you have kids, it's a good uh, science project with your kids. Put the broccoli stalks on one side of your bin and put your chopped watermelon rinds on another. And you will see which side the worms will eat. It will not be the, the uh, broccoli stalks. I guarantee it. Okay, so how much food scraps can you feed your worms? As I mentioned, they only eat in their, if you have a pound of worms, how, man, how many food scraps can you feed them a day? Only a quarter to a third of a pound of food scraps a day. So they're going to multiply. So as your bin increases in the number of worms you have, um, you're going to be able to feed them more. And you want to make sure that they eat the food scraps that you've given them before you give them more food scraps. So if you have two pounds of worms, you can only give them half a pound of fruit and vegetable scraps a day. They can't consume more than 25 to 35% of their weight. All right, so I mentioned that vermicomposting is all about surface area. You're gonna wanna add your vegetable and fruit scraps and thin layers to the top. The earthworms live in the three in the top three to six inches, and then they're gonna move up as the new kitchen scraps are added. And just some tips, keep, keep, um, uh, keep um, you know, monitor your temperature, keep the bedding moist by misting, never cover your worm bin with like a sheet of plastic, which cuts off oxygen. These bins that you can buy have holes in the top and you wanna wait until all the food scraps are eaten before piling more on top. So this is kind of a schematic of what it looks like, how they rise. This is a finished compost, so this is a tray that's done. Um, and then uh, there's different methods for s separating the worms and the finished compost. You do not need to pick out the worms. Again, you don't really wanna touch their sensitive skins as much as possible. So one method is, um, is um, you know, if you're doing this, this separation, as I mentioned before, you just, it's kind of vertical separation. You stop feeding, they rise to the next layer of bin. Uh, this is another one called light uh, separation. They don't like light. So you can kind of make these pyramid piles. Uh, you wait a minute or two, the, the worms go into the pile. You kind of scoop out the top. They keep going down. You can combine piles till you have one or two piles left. And when you turn that one pile over, it's the one that's full of the worms. So, um, all right, so I am concluding now with just some helpful tips and then we'll get to your questions. But for hot composting, you wanna turn, fluff, add air, check moisture, have your browns on hand. You wanna balance those browns and greens. Um, beware of popular bins that are too small. They tend to be, those tumblers tend to be cheaper, but they're not as good, it won't get hot. And you need to cure your compost. Vermicomposting, you don't turn your bin. You feed, smaller, feed them smaller pieces. Don't feed more until the last feeding is consumed. And for both, always cover your food scraps. You never want your food scraps exposed. You don't want 
uh, fruit flies in your bin. It's just a nuisance. So one way to avoid this is to cover your fruit scraps. So again, my apologies for going late, but here we are, part seven, your questions answered. So I'm gonna hand the mic to um, Megan to help uh, me get through this section. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions already. Um, and also some contact info is being shared as well. Um, great. So we had a bunch of question and answer questions people submitted. Again, you can upvote those um, if somebody else asked a question that you're interested in. Um, I'm gonna start, there were a few questions detailed about winter. Um, so are there best practices for composting when it's cold? What happens when the weather gets cold? What happens to your pile? Um, and if you can also touch on tumblers versus piles. Okay, <laughs> so you can compost through the winter. We have these valuable, uh, valuable, we have these fabulous videos of composting in Vermont where people are, some people run tubes through their compost pile in the snow and um, the water coming out is heated up and going into a hot tub outside. So um, you can compost in the winter. You really do want to think about a bigger volume there. And you can also think about insulating it. When I know in my area, we don't have deep freezes often, but I will tend to throw a blanket, cheap blanket with a tarp over it that I've gotten at a thrift store, the, the blanket that is at the thrift store. Um, and just to help insulate it, it can get frozen. So I do do worm composting more in the winter. And those worms do like to, you know, be kept warm again, above 55 degrees. So whether you're doing worm composting, but the heat comes from making them in hot composting, the heat comes from making the microorganisms happy. Now, best practices for compost in tumblers. Um, a bigger tumbler if you want it to get hot and just um, really try to get the oxygen in there. If you're, I, I know so many people that run into problems with tumblers. I think if you're just starting out a stationary system is easier to be honest, but you know, pay attention to your browns and the moisture level. It can get either too dry in there. It can get too wet and smelly in there. So um, just pay attention to that recipe and, and I think the hardest thing is getting oxygen in the bin. So when you open the hatch, maybe you have a, 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 a trowel or something, you can kind of get in there or gloved hands and mix it around. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I, there were a few questions that were sort of lumped around timing um, and how long the composting process should take. Um, and so the first question, are you saying the curing process itself could take six to 12 months? Oh, no, let me clarify this good question. So the hot process, if you're if you're an active composter, not a passive one, which can take longer, but let's say you're really, you know, you're getting air in your pile and there's actually, let me just say there's a range, right? You can go from a dump and run person where it just really breaks down like it does in the forest, your leaves take a year or you can be active turning every three days for the first three weeks. And there's everything in between. So don't worry, you don't have to be like active, active, or really like, you know, a dump and run person. You can be in between. I don't, I probably empty my bin like twice a year myself. So, um, and I'm, I just tend to be more passive. Mm -hmm. I do manage my temperatures, um, but um, yeah. So the timing is, let's say you're active. It's the first, and you've just built a new pile or you've been doing the lasagna method and it's finally full, right? So when it's finally full, like pitchfork it, try to mix it, flip it as best you can in there. And let's say, you know, that's two to three weeks of active composting. And then you know when the active stage is kind of ending is when it's the temperatures begin to drop and then it's becoming more ambient temperature and then it's gonna cure for that four weeks minimum. And then, you know, most farmers are I know who are doing composting, they don't use their compost product in their fields for like six months. That's their growing fields. If they've got a fallow field, you can add it. But if you've got plants, active plants growing, you really want it to be mature and stable. Great. Uh, yeah, so depends a little on use, but the curing stage isn't six months necessarily. Um, to the compost itself, 
Could you make compost under ideal conditions in 14 days? Um, there are some people that are experimenting with mycelium fungus to help speed the process at the end to break down. The, the, the fungi come in towards the end of the process and they're going to break down the tougher materials, like the woody materials. They thrive at the higher temperature. Um, they, they thrive, you know, they're there the, for many temperatures, but also um, they're really kind of come in at the end and finish the process. So I think we'll soon have more information on ways to speed the process. But if you are heard about a machine that you can buy for your kitchen and pay a lot of money for that promises to do compost in two days or 14 days, I would be very wary of those claims. Yeah. Uh, and then last question, sort of in this realm, uh, is your cured compost better the longer that it cures? So the question is like, is it like wine? <laughs> Um, does it get better? It it can. Sometimes it can dry out, um, and then the the all those beneficial mo microbes that are in that living material, um, you know, kind of disappear. So, you know, there is a balance. You know, you don't want it to just hang on for years and years, I suppose, or let it dry out and become, you know, have less that living biology in it. So, but yeah, I mean, generally, you know, it's like through the six month window, I mean, a year is probably fine, but just pay attention to things like that. Great. Uh, there were also a couple questions that came in before the webinar about startup costs, if you wanted to just comment on that. Yeah. But so, um, you know, you, the temperature probe I mentioned, I was saying things, the only thing I've mentioned is, was like about $50 a backyard probe. They're about two feet. Um, if you want to get one, uh, the, you can make your own bin with repurposed uh, wooden pallets if you've got, um, you're concerned about rodents or raccoons or other things in your area, possums, you know, you might want to, if you're handy, get hardware cloth and kind of, you know, make it more enclosed, uh, but you can do it yourself for very cheaply. You can even do uh, repurpose uh, these kind of blue barrels you see and make your own uh, tumbler. You, if you Google do it yourself tumblers for composting or Google, Google, Google do it yourself wooden pallet composters, you will see many designs. Uh, so, you know, uh, the ones that you buy, it really depends where you are. One thing I'll just encourage you, you know, they range retail from $80 to 140 for the stationary systems I'm seeing now, the tumblers, the bigger you get, if it's made out of metal or if it's insulated, they get more expensive, but they can also, the metal ones can be very well made, you know, rather than the plastic ones. And uh, they can last many years. So one thing I'll just say that even if you see it on Amazon, doesn't <laughs> mean it's the cheapest price. So do research and support your local hardware store. You might even walk in and say, I'd like, I don't see you selling it. I don't see it on your website. Can you carry this for me? They want to have your business. So give them your business. And then pitchforks and gloves and things like that are kind of minimal cost. If you already have a pitchfork, that's fine. If you don't have one and you're going to buy one, buy a manure fork or a compost fork. They have curved tines. They're a little more... Uh, pointy, so easier to get in your pile than a flat one with flat tines. Awesome. Super helpful. Uh, and I'll end with, there were a few questions sort of focused on materials. Um, so I think best practices around napkins, paper towels, office paper, sort of shredding paper. And how often can you add food scraps? Like, could you add things daily to your piles? Um, and would that be okay? Or should you space out how often you're adding things? Um, okay, so let me. Was the so, last material? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so remind me of the second question if I forget. But yes, paper. I just want to say, when in doubt, leave it out. So you've got some, you know, junk mail that was sent to you that looks like it's coated with plastic or glossy material. Leave it out. Uh, paper bags uh, are generally okay. You know, we use them for yard waste. Uh, most commercial composters take, you know, those craft yard waste bags and paper. 
uh, you do just want to shred them again you just don't want to create layers that airflow is not flowing through your pile so um bleached paper you know i personally don't add office paper that to my pile but i know lots of people that do um and i will sometimes do paper towels but i buy unbleached paper towels and if it's a cardboard box that's you know wax coated or plastic coated you know that's shipped outside the u.s from outside the u.s like just be a little bit more wary of those there's been um, more information the last few years on PFAS entering our soils. And one of the sources of PFAS has come from paper mills, it seems. Mm -hmm. So I am, you know, don't add, you know, if you if you got wrapping around your Subway sandwich, you know, that kind of grease paper with grease resistance in it is don't add it. In fact, you shouldn't be eating off of it. Like people ask, like, should I add that to my compost pile? No. Should I should I be ordering food in it? No. <laughs> so, you know, that's probably more exposure. So just be aware of those kind of products that have uh, the PFAS are added kind of like as a Teflon coating to prevent grease getting into your, you know, as a ba barrier. So don't add anything like that. Great. Yeah. And the second question was just frequency of adding oh, yeah. to your pile yeah. you it continuously or daily. Yeah. So I showed, um, um, you know, the, um, the stationary bins with the, with the catch open at the bottom where it's finished compost ready to, to harvest from the bottom of the bins. And those bins, one of the benefits of them, they're almost continuous flow and that you can add to the top and remove from the bottom. And so, um, so you don't need two. you don't like a, a tumbler at some point, you can continue to add every day when it stops heating up or begins to be full. That's probably an indication that you might want to, you know, remove the top, harvest the bottom. Like sometimes it's easier not to remove it from the hatch. I often just lift the whole bin up and move it, set it up right next to it with the hardware cloth, and then just scoop the, put the twigs on the bottom, scoop the top that's not broken down into the new, into the where I move the bin, harvest the bottom, and start again. So in a tumbler, at some point, you have to stop. That's why you might need two tumblers of what, buy a tumbler with a dual chamber, because you can't get finished compost if you're still adding fresh material to it. Great. Um, I think that answered the majority of our questions. I don't know if we want to keep going. There's still a couple more questions. Um, I'm happy to answer them if you are, but we can also yeah. end, Megan. <laughs> That's fine. Megan uh, and I did not talk in advance. What happens if Brenda goes long? <laughs> all good. Um, uh, two other material questions that were kind of specific. Should eggshells be rinsed? I never rinse my eggshells. Um, I know some people said you should bake them in the oven. <laughs> but, you know, um, if you're concerned about salmonella and you're not doing hot composting, you know, um, you could consider leaving them out. Um, we have had, this is not related to your question, but, um, you know, we have had outbreaks in, in the U.S. in the last five years, I think two outbreaks of, I think it was salmonella on romaine lettuce, might have been E. coli, mm -hmm. I think it was salmonella. I think we've had E. coli on spinach. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do get those pathogens in in kitchen scraps that might end up in compost. So that is a reason, you know, leave it out if there's an outbreak for sure. Don't put it in your compost pile. But if you're reaching 131 degrees for three days straight, you're going to re reduce the risk of those pathogens creating any problems. Like soil has pathogens in it. It's just that you don't want those pathogens to proliferate and become a problem you know, background pathogen levels are normal. Um, but, um, and eggs, you know, I don't rinse my eggs. I crush them um, sometimes with worms, with the worm bin. And if you don't want to see the shells, you can dry them out and, and put them under like a rolling pin and really finely crush them, <laughs> which the worms like better. That helps with their gizzards and gives them the grit, by the way. Thing. And uh, is there any issue with adding lemon rinds or other citrus rinds to your home composting? No, I mean, you know, if, if that's your only food scraps coming out of your kitchen, you may run into some problems. Uh, but I, we eat a lot of citrus in my family and 
you know, it's mixed in with a bunch of other stuff, so it's not a problem. It disappears. In the worm bin, you don't want to add citrus. So avoid citrus altogether in your worm bin. Great. Uh, how do you store compost properly? Um, so, you know, if you have, um, if, if you have a, if you've made a three, you know, it's, it's good to have it covered because during a rain event, you know, you don't want a storm washing away your compost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's a tarp over a pile, or let's say you have, if you've seen those metal trash cans with the holes in it, you can put it in there. It, you know, you should keep it aerated, you know, not completely in a plastic bag. Even when you buy compost from a store, like in, in bags, they usually have at least pinpricks in them to allow some air in it. So, um, so just, but yeah, keep it under cover. Try not to let it dry out too much. And can you introduce worms to finished compost in the bin? Um, there's no reason to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, a couple last questions about equipment specifics. Uh, you mean, yeah, go ahead. I just wanna, I just wanna add to that. So if you've <laughs> got um, the, the microorganisms that break down the materials in your bin come from like the leaves and the yard trimmings um, that you're adding to your bin. Uh, in the longer worm composting training we do, we do suggest that you get grab like a handful of soil to add to your bin because one handful of soil has like billions and billions, if not trillions of microorganisms in it and grit. So that can kind of inoculate it. You're not grabbing that soil for the earthworms. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting the right Asenia fetida earthworms. But, um, but in a stationary system that's on the ground, a lot of those microorganisms are coming up and proliferating into your pile because it's on the ground. So you don't, you don't need to introduce inoculants or microorganisms into your pile, your worm bin or your hot composting pile. Great. Um, yeah, and then a couple equipment specifics. Um, do you know the model number for the temperature gauge, the Rio temp or? Oh, um, if... it's just, a, I think it's just called the backyard, the backyard probe. So I don't know the model number. But Great. it's the two foot, 24 inch backyard probe. Should Great. be, I think that's what it's called. Um, and then you mentioned a couple types of pitchfork, um, a manure fork and a compost fork. Were those the two types or what yeah, are the they're, they're basically the same. So they're kind of curved tines and more pointy and not flat. I think it's called a potato fork is kind of flat, and yeah. flat tines, so. Great. Uh, and people asked as well if we were going to share these slides out in addition to the recording so that they could credit us and ILSR, um, or are we just doing the recording? We were just planning to do the recording, but we could um, probably make a PDF with maybe a couple of slides, two to four slides on a page and send that out if that would be helpful. So we, we can do that to you. For those of you who attended, we couldn't do that. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Um, those were all of our Q and A uh, questions that came in, um, and we're now getting some nice kudos. Great presentation. Lots of thank yous. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, and thanks we're... Megan for staying with me as I went long here, <laughs> and thanks for joining us on a Saturday morning, everyone. So happy fall, happy composting. <laughs>